we would like to ask everyone to hold their questions till the end, just to ensure that they remain confidential and we'll stop recording at that point. So I'm gonna pause and make sure I can record. Or maybe Shelly, you can just record, is that? Yeah, I went ahead and started it. Okay, cool, thanks so much. So um, before we introduce our guests, I'd just like to um, explain a little bit more about the Let's See You Well initiative as part of the larger Be Well platform. Our goal is to support a culture of care for all of our College of Arts and Sciences members, faculty, students, and staff. So we've got a range of resources on the Be Well page, including opportunities to highlight faculty research related to wellness. Um, and it's designed to um, highlight College of Arts and Sciences research and application in an inclusive and um, innovative way. So this month's theme, the January theme is all about fire support and our theme is adversity and renewal. We are focusing on our efforts on really trying to push more information about the resources that Shelly just listed and our guests will speak to a little bit more. Um, Dean White did send out an email earlier this morning detailing these resources, including links. And so we are in the process of updating that on the Be Well site. So without further ado, today it's my honor to introduce our two special guests who are going to offer a little bit more about the resources in their offices and also um, some direct support in today's session. First up, we have Carla Eugene, who is a staff counselor with a multicultural focus out of the Office of FSAP, Faculty Staff Assistance Program. And... We also have Jessica Ladd Webert, who is the Director of Office of Victims Assistance. So I'm, I'm really honored that they were able to join us with such late, um, late notice. So if we could give them a warm College of Arts and Sciences welcome, I will pass things over to them. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy to be here and to I represent Faculty Staff Assistance Program. Thank you for the warm welcome, Erin and Shelly as well. Um, and so Jessica and I will move forward to presenting. Um, Jessica, would you like to share um, the presentation from your end? Sure, I can share that, yep. Okay, um, but before we get started, we will have lots of information. Um, since we are recording, we thought it might be best to save some of the questions towards the end. Um, so that you feel free to share however you feel or whatever you'd like to share because of the topic. Um, we wanted to allow that space um, towards the end. Um, we'll also have um, a little bit of a participation activity um, to kind of get your minds thinking and involved in our discussion. So feel free to um, also be a part of that as well once we get to that part of the presentation. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, our presentation today is around managing mental health during traumatic events. Um, as we've already been said, my name is Carla and then Jessica will be also presenting with me today. Hi everyone, I was gonna say thank you for the warm welcome, but Aaron Googled and found some old, old picture of me. So I don't know how warm I am anymore, but just <laughs> um, <laughs> be here representing my role as director of the Office of Victim Assistance. I will, for about one more month, be the interim director of counseling and psych services, but their new director will be starting next month. So thank you so much for having us. Clicking, clicking, click. There we go. Okay. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of information for those of you that may or may not be familiar with FSAP, just so that everyone um, can be aware of what we offer. Um, so that all of our employees, um, student and staff, are offered up to seven free confidential counseling sessions within a year. However, if you were impacted by the fire, uh, we are extending that and creating space to provide services as long as, as needed. So we offer a therapy for individuals, families, um, and also couples. Um, we have part-time and a uh, week service, sorry, uh, part-time and full-time employees. Um, we offer workshops lunch and learns. Um, my role specifically is, is new and I'll be working to promote mental health counseling for the BIPOC community and services and workshops. I'll be putting those on as well. Um, we also offer departmental requests such as this. Um, we are a team of five staff counselors and we have one intern. And then um, we also offer services in Spanish. 
And you definitely can reach out to us for a referral list if you want to be connected to community supports. And then also, which I forgot to mention on here, is that we have something called Let's Chat. Every day from two to three, we have two slots, two 30-minute slots that can be either in person or online, where we will offer just kind of like consultation. So it's not necessarily therapy. It's just an open space. You have something going on. You want just a quick conversation. Feel free to sign up for those. Those are every single day um, from two to three. You can go on our website towards the bottom. You'll see where it says, let's chat, and you can sign up there. Hello. So the Office of Victim Assistance is the free and confidential trauma-focused center. So we serve CU students as well as our faculty and staff. We are similar to FSAP as we're all licensed clinicians, and we are a small office, um, but we are really narrowly focused. So we specifically are focusing in traumatic events, anything from disasters to harassment, a sexual violence, partner abuse, discrimination, experiences of bias. Um, so our scope is really specific to responding and supporting those impacted by a variety of traumatic experiences that happened recently or in the past. Our advocacy um, services are focused on helping people know their rights and options. Um, that could be, I had no idea I could apply for 160 days, or I had no idea what a protection order was or I had no idea how to find these resources. Um, and so we are here to help people either get information, navigate resources. Um, in certain situations, we'll go to court or sit in an equity meeting or a conduct meeting uh, to support someone who's reporting. So advocacy is really about informed decision-making and, and accurate information and not having to navigate things alone. Um, being clinicians, we can also be a one-stop shop for short-term counseling specifically related to healing from trauma. And so um, our, our services, like I said, are narrow in scope, and we have staff that are specifically trained and work with trauma. Uh, we also have Ask an Advocate hours because everyone had to have a slightly different name. So we got Let's Talk for CAPS, we got Let's Chat for FSAP, and we got Ask an Advocate for OVA which is a brief time to drop in. We have in-person starting next month. We have virtual sessions. It's on our website when our hours are. But if someone doesn't want a full intake, they just maybe want to ask a quick question, we've opened our Ask an Advocate for students, staff, and faculty, and we'll be relaunching that next month. Um, so you can find that on our website. And then the last thing we do, of course, also is present presentations focused on trauma. Our number one presentation that Erin has seen numerous times and your advisors have seen is our supporting survivors, um, as well as how to do trauma-informed mandatory reporting for those of you that are required to report certain things. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about the impact of trauma, things that might be coming up for, for ourselves or for our colleagues and peers or students. And so we always like to start um, broadly uh, with what is trauma. Um, it's, you know, an event that can have psychological emotional response and it's really impacting, really impacting someone specifically and deeply. And it can happen with both internal or external resources. And it's really when I'm not able to cope. Like it's a serious event that has overwhelmed my coping abilities. Um, so that's Bessel van der Kolk. There are many different definitions out there around trauma. We also like to note when we start talking about trauma that people can have the exact same experience and respond differently. So we also have to remember that trauma is also influenced by who we are, our backgrounds, our cultures, our identities, our access to resources, our community, our support systems. So we have to remember that we might have people impacted by the fires in, with the exact same things happening to them, but having different needs, having different physiological and emotional responses. I'm sorry, I lost my notes. So I'm trying, my screen's available to me. I'll just keep going, there you go. Um, so we know that there are different types of trauma, trauma that can happen one time. We have people who might have 
an abusive uh, partner, experiencing ongoing discrimination. So we got reoccurring um, events and also people who have historical trauma in their history or intergenerational trauma. We could probably give a whole hour presentation on the different types of trauma out there. We just want to acknowledge that it's not just one type. Um, we also have secondary trauma. And I think that's really important to mention today is that sometimes we haven't experienced it specifically, but our loved ones have, our students have, our peers have, and we can have impact um, as a secondary uh, person caring about someone, knowing someone who is impacted. And I think with what's happened in our community over the last year, not to mention a pandemic, I think you know that's something we also should be aware of and looking at, and it's okay if we're having that secondary impact. And it's also important to note that and not ignore it. I've lost my notes, Carla. So when you wanna jump in, you jump in while I try and uh, find them. No problem, no problem. Okay, so we wanna kind of shift to talking a little bit about common reactions to trauma. Um, I kind of separated them out here to cognitive, emotional, physical, and behavioral. So as you're thinking about different events that you've experienced, um, whether it's this current um, event going on with the fires or other events, kind of take a, a, a mental note to see if you've experienced any of these, any of these reactions. So cognitively, you can kind of go through this blue uh, column here, whether that's uh, disoriented or some confusion, difficulty trying to make decisions, possibly um, memory loss. And then you have um, the next column, which is more emotional. So you have that initial shock and we'll talk about that shock and numbness in a, a couple of slides. Um, you might be feeling overwhelmed, right? What do I do? How do I respond to this? Um, feeling lost, uncertain, um, feeling of, of harm, maybe even to self or others. And that kind of gets into um, some emotions that are worthy of attention. Um, you might be feeling abandoned um, by maybe people you thought that would respond that haven't responded, uh, maybe colleagues or peers, um, or even also by like a spiritual connection. Um, then there's a, this uncertainty of feelings or even sometimes feeling volatile or even angry. The next column is talking about physical reaction. So um, whatever happens um, to us outside of us also impacts inwardly. So we start to have this, these physiological responses to stress. So you might have some tremors, you're on edge, you're feeling nauseous, um, some lightheadedness, maybe stomach aches, um, maybe GI problems or fatigue. Um, we're hearing difficulty sleeping. We're hearing um, also the same thing of like headaches or even some, some nausea, occurring, nausea occurring. And then there's this behavioral aspect, which is the last column when you're just kind of irritable. Um, you may be sometimes like jittery or, or on edge. Um, some people may get into arguments with family or friends just because they're so emotionally taxed that it shows in their behaviors. Um, there may be excessive silence. So wanting to remain kind of in solitude, not knowing what to say because of the numbness and emotion, the behavior shows up as that withdrawal or excessive silence. Um, increased or even decreased eating. So not having an appetite. I've had um, people share those experiences recently with the fire, just not having um, any appetite, needing to just respond to um, what's happening and just not having time or even thinking about eating. Um, changes in sexual desire, increased in some um, unhealthy behaviors as well um, with substance abuse or um, other Inappropriate humor may come out as well. Um, just not really knowing how to um, establish that kind of sense of homeostasis and so responding in these ways. Um, and so something I also wanted to mention, uh, to mention that, is that some of this is kind of that, um, that natural stress, that natural response. So there's this natural response, which is most of these things I mentioned here, but then there are other ones that are worthy of attention, such as like panic attacks, or even um, wanting to be violent or get into some sort of um, expression of emotion that's inappropriate, that does happen. Um, and so I wanted to mention that, that, that there are some things that become worthy of attention um, when the isolation happens for too long, when the, whenever the um, disorientation or the confusion happens for too long, then uh, we will talk about in later slides, um, we'll talk about how to address some of those things if that does become an issue of someone that you see or even your own. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so I mentioned that we kind of come to talking around numbness and some other emotional reactions. So I wanted to kind of present this um, grief cycle for many of you probably have heard of this, some of you maybe just a little, but just so that we're on the same page, I just wanna kind of give this understanding of this Kubler-Ross grief cycle. Um, so when we experience this um, unexpected loss, um, they, these are the phases. Um, so we're gonna kind of work from left to right, I think, and hopefully it shows that on your side, um, where you start with denial. So I wanna add shock and denial is um, the first stage where you have this immediate awareness of this fire happening or this other traumatic event. Everyone's kind of in chaos or people are just in disbelief, um, which then leads to this avoidance or confusion um, or this fear, right? Um, you may even find yourself going to sleep, waking up in the next morning thinking, did that really happen? Wow, that did happen. So you do have those um, emotions uh, that come up that are part of that denial first uh, cycle of, of this uh, grief. Then from there, which I'm also hearing, um, is uh, anger, right? Um, knowing that the situation occurred, uh, looking at maybe um, disappointment, um, complete just frustration, anxiety, all um, bottled up into this anger. Um, if you're not aware, anger is a secondary emotion. So there's underlying things that, that start, that show up as anger, but these underlying emotions tend to be frustration, or irritation, anxiety, and so forth. And that's that next stage. Um, during the stage, you're also having gathering information and communicating, which is kind of at that bottom part of this that I wanted to kind of illuminate here as well. So you're just being flooded with information, what happened, how did this happen, um, and so forth, which is a part of that cycle and happening underneath. Then you might come to a stage of bargaining. If I could have done something differently, struggling to find meaning, why did this happen? How did this happen, right? Um, if I could have just done this, then maybe this would be different if I could do that. So this bargaining type of uh, reaction to this loss, um, reaching out to others, um, telling your story. So in this stage, you're seeking some emotional support because you're trying to wrap your mind around at this time what actually happened, okay? And then there's the stage of, of coming to the depression. So the loss has set in. Feelings of being overwhelmed, helplessness. Um, may, maybe you want to flight and just kind of get away from the situation, isolate, withdraw. Um, depression and sadness tends to set in at this point of the cycle. Um, and then there's the, finally, you get to the stage of acceptance. So it's not getting over it. It's working through it, finding ways to manage it. Um, exploring options. What is the plan? How do we work through this, right? Um, and that stage, um, I kind of like to present, this stage is kind of like ongoing. So just pretend that black line that's at the top just goes straight all the way to the end of time. I also want to mention that these stages are very fluid. Uh, they don't have to be sequential. Uh, they can be very much kind of like cycles and kind of in and out to where um, you may have triggers, which we'll talk about later on as well. Um, and they might get you back into the stage of anger. Um, you might go back into the stage of sadness or depending on what's going on around you, that might remind you of this loss. And so also this stage um, or this cycle in general um, doesn't have a specific amount of time. Technically, um, diagnosis wise, when we talk about some of those uh, responses that are worthy of attention do come up at a certain time. But as far as working through acceptance, and all of that, it does, it can be ongoing and just different for different people. Okay, next slide. Well, I was gonna add to that, and I'm so yeah. glad um, you talked about the secular nature, as you notice mm. the timeline, right? We didn't put day one, day three, you know, week five on here because this can look different for people not only being secular, but for some, this could be their first week. This could, you know, that at the bottom could be much, much longer, like months, if not more than that. So we have to remember um, that time part is also fluid. And some of these other emotions we, when Carla and I were, were preparing, talked about is sometimes during denial and anger, you might also have some shock and numbness um, mm -hmm. and also be part of even anger. You go all the way to numb. And then during bargaining, you might also find some kind of disorganization. Um, you might have to tell people things a few times as they're trying to struggle for that meaning give that information. And so just know that disorganization can also get interwoven um, as actually slowly move to recovery and reorganization. Um, but something could happen and push them back, like she said. So mm -hmm. it's, 
it's while this was built for grief, it, it's really applicable to also. Mm -hmm. And Jessica, you made me think of one more thing before we move on to the next slide, which is about um, the acceptance and the new um, state that you be, that you are you're in and the new person that you become because of this loss. You could look differently. You may not mm -hmm. return back to the person that you were before the loss, and that's okay. That's a mm -hmm. part of being human. That's a part of dealing with loss. And um, grief, I always say, is the price we pay for love, the price we pay for the things that we love and the people that we love, we, we experience grief. Um, and that can change us a bit. So I just wanted to recognize that if um, trying to seek after the person that you were before this loss um, may not come, you might shift to be someone different, um, but that's still a good thing. And, and that's a part of the acceptance part of this, this space. So what you get, two therapists in a room together, <laughs> bouncing them off each other. I love it. All right. Okay. So I wanted to talk about this um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're familiar with this, I may be a refresher. If not, this might be something new. But I just wanted to kind of create this, this awareness and understanding around um, what might be happening um, when you're dealing with um, a traumatic event. We're built... Um, if you look at this uh, pyramid here from the bottom up. So when you think about um, who we are as individuals, how we kind of establish this sense of stability and homeostasis, we go from the bottom. So we look at what are our phys uh, physiological needs. So our food, water, warmth, rest, um, breathing, blinking, like those typical uh, experiences that happen in our body with or without us, that's what we're trying to uh, that's the basis of who we are. And we're trying, we always come back to whenever we are dealing with a traumatic event. Um, some of the other things, for example, someone who might say, you know, I need to remember, like I was asking someone, oh, how old are you? And she's like, I don't, I have to like figure this out. I, I, no one has asked me this before all this happened. And so, because she's just in the stage of trying to manage um, this traumatic event. And so um, the establishing that safety is what's on her mind right now. And so, um, this is a chart of that. So the first part is establishing a sense of safety or basic needs, and then safety, right? Security, where do I go? Um, who, who do I turn to for that sense of, of security? And from there, this might last for quite a while, depending on, for example, loss of a home. It might take some time to, to deal with establishing safety, establishing who, who are your people to be able to connect with. And so um, you might stay in this basic need part of, um, this pyramid. From there, then you move to a sense of belonging, intimate relationships, friends, like this, this means like um, spending time cultivating, right? So when you're establishing a sense of safety, you might connect with friends, but making new friendships or working on friendship, that does not happen until you are able to uh, get some sort of safety and your uh, physiological needs are being met. From there, then you move to the next part, which is uh, esteem. So prestige, a feeling of accomplishment, this is where work enters in, where you're finally able to maybe respond to some things at work, give more to work once these other lower layers of the pyramid um, have been addressed, okay? So then from there, once you're kind of building on that, then you reach this top part, which is that self-actualization. So your fullest potential. Um, being able to be creative, being able to reach um, kind of that, which is this, this part of your brain, which is that frontal cortex, which is where planning, prioritizing, thinking about thinking, all of that lies up here in, in the brain. And so um, a lot of times that shuts off when you're dealing with trauma. And so you go all the way down to dealing with what are my basic needs. And so in this pyramid, it talks about how eventually once the other parts of the pyramid have been established, then you reach that sense of self-actualization. And so being patient with yourself, if you're not um, feeling like connecting with people, if you're not feeling a sense of belonging or achieving higher than you um, maybe what you were before, um, being sensitive to that right now is, is something that we want to challenge you to do. Okay, so I wanted to mention some ways to cope after a disaster. Um, the first part in that, that first blue column talks about steps to care for yourself. So just remembering that um, this information can, uh, you know, differ in differ, uh, differing uh, variances and levels, but just wanting to mention that these are things that are helpful tactics and strategies. So taking care of your body is important. Um, the first couple of days, may, you might not want to eat. Um, you may not want, may not be able to sleep. 
Um, but eventually, this is something we really want to, to mention as an important part of working through uh, trauma. Um, connecting, um, sharing your feelings, talking about them is going to be so important. Um, and of course, the people that you trust. Uh, maintaining some of those relationships when ready, I think is important, or connecting to those that are in your home or in your space that you feel uh, that you trust is important. Taking breaks, um, make time to unwind. I remember I was talking to someone and they were saying, I finally was able to like go out and walk my dog. You know, finally got a chance to take that break. And that might just be the break, right? Or just going out for a walk wherever you might be, even if it's temporary housing or back in your home. I'm being able to do that, even if it's going to grab a bite to eat. Um, staying informed, I'll say staying informed and avoiding, or I'm going to connect the two. Um, it's important to be able to stay informed um, with um, reliable news sources or reliable officials. However, it's also important to avoid unnecessary connection, whether that's through Facebook, whether that is TV. Sometimes healthy connection might be, um, or healthy self-care might be that you're, you're avoiding some of the TV um, and connecting with yourself and your family to be able to establish that sense of care. And then ask for help when needed, whether that means your spiritual guides or counselors or even your doctor. There's a number here from SAMHSA that they offer to work through trauma as well, or even text. And so there are ways to make sure that you are well and that you're um, able to cope through this um, time. The other thing I want to mention is that we often sometimes we, we forget uh, to our, our kids and that they are also um, having questions. They also need reassurance. And so I wanted just to put that in here um, of what things that you might need to take note of is that it's okay to share age appropriate information. It's okay to reassure them, even if we don't have all the answers. It's okay to say that. I don't have all the answers, but we're together, right? We're connecting, um, addressing rumors. You may even want to ask questions of them or mention questions that they might have that they might not be asking um, because those things are really helpful with moving the family through um, these types of situations. Um, taking care of yourself is also a way to set a good example. Um, but then assisting your children with limiting um, some media exposure, there will be things that, that they won't be able to avoid, right? Friends or people that might ask questions or things happening at school, but trying to, at least when they're in your care and in your home, limiting some of those, um, some of that access and exposure. And then these are common signs of distress. We talked about this. This is from SAMHSA and CDC. Um, and so I'm not going to go back over that. These are some of the things I've already mentioned, but just wanted to have that here as well. All right. Yeah, things to be looking out for within yourselves as well as with those that you care about and your peers and colleagues and family members. So we're gonna move towards now, um, if you're supporting someone after a traumatic event, some things to do and avoid as well. Um, and while I start with, we need to check on their safety first. How is that person doing? Are you concerned at all about their physical or emotional safety? Before you even do that, Let's check in with ourselves. Do I feel safe enough to help someone? Do I have the capacity right now to help others? Or should I right now need to focus on myself? And I think that's hard for people. There's a lot of um, people who don't put themselves first, but lots of quotes out there that we can't serve from an empty vessel. Gotta put the oxygen mask on ourselves first before we help others or we'll be passed that on the floor. So first check on our own safety. And then if you're like, yep, I have some capacity right now to give and to help. Um, and that's when you'll then start supporting another person and checking in on their emotional and physical safety. We then want to start with listening. Um, we want to avoid fixing um, or asking really kind of closed ended questions, asking questions that will open dialogue, listening for emotions being shared either verbally or um, through body language, being open to whatever might be shared um, and being ready for a range of emotions. Um, I know again, Carla and I were, were talking yesterday and some people might be expressing anger and it might even feel like that anger is directed at you, but that is really you know, what is going on for them. And so being ready and open to different emotions and then wanting to follow their lead, avoid fixing it um, instead giving information. 
Now, if they ask you to fix something like, yes, could you go please pick up my dog? That's different. Um, but if they aren't asking for that fixing, really give them information, give them options, and then kind of follow their lead on what they need next. Because you might think, oh, this person needs this, but you haven't had their experience or you know, they might have other needs. And so really following what they're wanting and they're deciding and making time to sit with emotions and talk with emotions, whatever they are, uh, validate the emotion that you're witnessing or observing. And they might wanna share a lot, they might not wanna share much at all. And again, kind of following that. Um, by summarizing what you hear, they're gonna feel listened to and will help you make sure that you're getting accurate information. And another kind of example of an open-ended question is what would be helpful to you right now? Um, I got some food right here. They might take it, they might not. Um, you don't want to do any silver lining, which I don't want to spoil our video here in a moment, but avoid doing any kind of at least. Um, this is not as bad as it could have been. Avoid doing anything like that. It's really common for us to want to fix it, to want to silver lining it, um, but that's not going to be helpful in the moment. And don't explain it away. Don't explain away the anger. Validate the anger, validate the numbness or the sadness and, and be someone that can share or sit with them in that emotion. So I borrowed this from a different crisis center, Rain, but I really like it, is remember to talk, which really means don't talk. <laughs> um, Thank them for sharing whatever they have shared with you. Ask them what would be helpful to you right now? What can I get for you? What can I do for you? Listen, which doesn't mean waiting for the next time to, to speak. And then keep supporting. Um, don't do just one time check in, uh, check in again a few days later. Um, even if, you know, I, I have a colleague, I'm pretty sure we all have someone who was impacted, you know, I'm not texting them every day. But I picked something up, sent them a picture of it. Then a couple of days later, we had a phone call. So keep checking in and kind of follow their lead on what their needs might be and how they want to talk about it. So I think I got my sound ready to go for the video. I'm going to be like, OK, I think everything's going to work. Let's see. I got a new monitor at home. I have my share screened. So we wanted to share a Brene Brown video that maybe some of you have seen. I have to say, I got excited when Carla shared the PowerPoint with me. I was like, oh, we use that in over presentations. So this is a, a, um, a video about empathy that Brene Brown um, does a talk about. Um, before we start the video, I wanna mention that after it, we're gonna talk about the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. And that we hope this starts a conversation on how to support people and some things to avoid. It's not a perfect video. We, of course, always want to edit it after we watch it a million times, but we will ask for some dialogue after the video. So please message me in the chat if uh, you're not hearing my sound. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy. Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, 
Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Right. So what are people's reactions, thoughts? If you want to put anything in the chat um, in response to that video, since we've just been talking for a little while now. Look for any people coming off me. Such an important distinction, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for, for me to really want to highlight, since I've been giving this video for a long time and been receiving many feedbacks on the pros and challenges of it, is empathy isn't always something we all have. It actually can take work. And for some people, depending on who they are, it takes a lot of work to be able to offer it and, and do that. Um, and so I like to throw up definitions on the screen afterwards of what empathy is or sympathy. And then the more and more trainings I go to, there's been this idea of compassion because we also want to be careful. Like that bear took on the cloud, right? From the fox, like took it on. And I would really like the video to then show him taking it off and taking care of himself. Like I don't, if I was a trauma therapist and I took every single gray cloud of my clients and I've been doing this work for 20 years, I wouldn't be here probably talking to you all. So we also need this idea of compassion. Um, because we also need to take care of ourselves as we take care of others. Um, a few other highlights from the video I like to mention is she said, you know, avoid judgment. And in my supporting survivors presentations, I always like to say, don't judge. But I really would prefer to say, we are going to make judgments. We're human beings. We make judgments all the time. So I'm not going to get up here and tell you not to judge. I'm going to just say, when you're talking to someone who's experienced a trauma or is choosing to share a trauma with you, um, don't share those judgments. Note them. Wow, I'm noticing this judgment is coming up or I'm having this reaction. I might want to go talk to my own friend or my own therapist about what's coming up for me. But we don't want to share that in the moment. We also don't always have to hug. Some people want hugs. They do. Some of us don't want to be touched. And so just kind of acknowledging that, checking in on that. Um, and uh, those are just a few of my thoughts on the video. Uh, would you like to add anything else, Carla? No, I just love that video. I really think it gives such a great illustration. I think somebody mentioned that in the chat, um, an illustration of, of how the difference between the two and the importance of um, working towards being empathetic for a person. I think it's just really powerful. Um, and I think what she talked about, we want to make things better for someone. So it's not always that we're doing something that, you know, to be I don't know. We're trying, I think the, the thing I want to mention is that we are trying to be helpful. Um, and so at times we think we're being helpful by saying, oh, at least, or by, you know, sometimes even taking over the story, you give your example of something and then the attention comes on you instead of on the other person. So um, being able to um, keep those things in mind, I really loved how it, it portrayed that in the illustration. So and I think, I mean, I haven't watched a video actually for a few months, which is like the longest for me. Um, but at the end, you know how it says it's, 
it's not about what we said. It's about how we made the person feel. And I sadly have been responding to a lot of disasters in my career and recently, and we've been noticing a lot of people, um, not always ill-intended, start to have someone express something distressful to them. I was in that store. I had my house X, Y, or Z. And the first response was, oh my gosh, you better go talk to FSAP. You better go see OVA. Like the first response is to like throw a resource at them. And again, I'm not saying that's done in ill will, but I would say that a lot of people don't always come to FSAP and OVA right away because they're looking for that community response. After everything that happened in Boulder a couple months ago, and now with this new event, like community response is really what's healing. And if their faculty member or their advisor or their colleague and peer spends a few minutes with them, validating their emotions, building empathy and, and compassion, that's what they might need right now, not just a quick referral. They want that human connection. That felt a little soapboxy, but I, maybe I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> that's good. There's a few things in the chat that we're seeing. Um, people are saying I wanted to kind of highlight. Um, yeah. Stephanie said um, that she likes to say I'm standing by and then await direction to take a specific action. Um, and so I, I, I love that. I think that's awesome. And you may have to say that a couple of times um, because a person may not necessarily just reach out um, just because you said it once. So I really appreciate that. Someone said intentions may be helpful, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is the best way to help that person. Becky mentioned that. So I appreciate these comments. I think that they really um, take the essence of what we're saying. Absolutely. Yep. When I go like this, I, it means I agree or yes, it's become my like go-to in Zoom world, but I'm saying that as I read the comments as well. <laughs> so we are moving on to some supportive tasks. Um, we thought, you know, people like to go to a presentation to learn some information, learn some skills. Um, so we wanted to come up with some ideas. It's not an exhaustive list. But um, some supportive um, ideas um, is, you know, suggesting and trying to see how we can keep up with some parts of a routine, um, identifying like basic needs, concrete needs, thinking back to when Carla talked about um, Maslow's hierarchy. A lot of people right now are focused on those basic needs um, and how can we help with some of those. Like yesterday, you know, so I brought someone food. Um, and I think I've said it a few times, so I won't keep saying it after this, but right, you know, don't avoid feelings and don't try and fix the feelings. Feelings are real. We have feelings and, and that's okay. Um, and so how can we connect and let people express and feel validated with their feelings so they don't have to hold it and bottle it up, which is the opposite of helpful and healing. Um, we gotta be encouraging flexibility. I was super excited about the additional leave. Like for example, HR just gave, that's one thing, but all sorts of other flexibilities with ourselves and with people who might be impacted. Um, we're gonna go over all the resources we were able to compile at the end, uh, finding who is a support and finding that someone might be a support. Like I'm gonna go to this person because I don't wanna talk about it. And they'll be really great at like, you know, talking about the newest episodes of, I don't know if I want to out what I'm watching right now, but anyways, the newest episodes of X, Y, or Z. Um, but no, I want to go to this person because I do want to talk about it and they're a really good listener and they're really good at validating my feelings. So I'm going to go here. So, you know, looking at our resources and using them sometimes in different ways and then checking our expectations of how quickly someone might heal, what someone might need or not need, how quickly I might heal or what I might need. Um, so this really can be applied in both ways. The, other, the last part of that, checking your expectations, I think it's important to notate that a person may not want help. Yep. Um, depending on their relationship with you, um, whatever they're going through outside of work, um, it might just be kind of their own, own the bubble and just wanting to um, keep that separate. And so checking your expectations also means that their particular traumatic event is not about you and being able to be okay with that. That, hey, you know, they just, they're, they're not, I've, I've asked a couple of times, they're not open to that. And so just being able to kind of keep your emotions at bay um, when a person might do that and checking those emotions in that way too. So I just wanted to mention that and to keep that in mind. I was just seeing Denise's comment and I really like that. I think we're gonna 
continue to talk about some ideas for supervisors. So thank you for saying that. And yes, we're being very specific um, and tying a lot to the recent fires, but this definitely applies broader. Um, mm -hmm. And we would love this. Um, we're actually going to be offering this presentation to all of staff and faculty next Wednesday. So thanks for being our dry run. <laughs> oh, here's the slide. Okay. Yes, this, please write to that slide. So thanks, Denise. <laughs> um, and what you had mentioned just about being able to use these points for managers and supervisors, I think this is um, the slide that we wanted to highlight, which is do's and don'ts. Um, I have um, seen um, both sides of this, honestly, um, with these particular traumatic events where a person um, might think that they're doing uh, the right thing and, and, and not, uh, not doing so. So of course, listening um, instead of being critical, um, I can't believe they're reacting this way or um, judgmental, like um, Jessica already mentioned, you're gonna have judgments, but just trying to keep those in check and expressing that empathy. Um, acknowledging that the person is having a difficult time instead of saying, you know, oh, it'll be better tomorrow or next week, or those kinds of things. Being with them in the moment is also being empathetic. Um, asking questions about their experience um, could be something to, and not in like a, a badgering way or just to find information, but more so, what can I do? Um, kind of those open-ended questions instead of what happened, you know, which is those closed-ended questions uh, in, a, in a different way, uh, but more so, it's, you're asking more about how you can be of support. Um, ignore the vibe of the, or, of the organization, you know, just being able to kind of just be yourself, being human and, and creating space for your colleague or your friend um, is really important. Um, be brief and simple with your responses. I mentioned that a minute ago, you might think you're doing well by giving your full example of how you handled something. and It might be too much. So being brief, and if they ask, okay, tell me more about that, or how did you handle that, then you might be invited to share more about your experience. Um, but by in doing that, what you should not do is shut your office door, engage in minimal contact with your team because it feels uncomfortable for you. And that's also um, what I mentioned about not making it about you. And I know these things can be really um, discomforting and just really maybe even cause you to think about your own experiences or some things that you haven't shared with other people, but trying to kind of take that hat off and put on that empathetic hat as much as you can um, is really going to be encouraged. Um, acknowledging if you're also having a diff um, difficult time, um, use, but don't use the situation as an opportunity to share your story about irrelevant past experiences, which I already said. Um, be okay with crying, sadness, quietness around the office. Um, be okay with that. Um, and I really want to highlight that, that, that uh, we are such in a hurry to make things better, to make things right, to get things going um, back to normal, which um, at times when a person has experienced trauma or a group of people, community, it's important to be um, empathetic to that. Um, give advice, but do, um, don't give advice, I'm sorry, but do give factual information um, around what's happening. So when people are asking, how can I what can I do? How do I you know, take the time off that I need? That's what you would be able to give information about. And then do be flexible. We've mentioned that when appropriate um, with time off or work arrangements or support from HR, um, it might be able to, it might pull you away from uh, your normal way of responding to things, but being able to be flexible in this moment is going to be so helpful. It will make you a better a team for it, uh, more um, better morale within your um, department or within your um, workspace. Um, and don't ignore your own feelings and responses. You're not immune to secondary trauma. Um, and so if you're feeling heavy when you're going home, um, you have a colleague who's maybe lost their home or dealt with another traumatic event and you're feeling um, pretty down about that, don't ignore that. You don't have to try to shove that into a pocket somewhere. It's when you are feeling safe. It's okay to share that because um, it's important for you to try your best to be well so that you can support other people. Um, and so not ignoring that is really something that we want to hone in on as well. Jessica, do you have anything to add to that part? Nope, I think that was very thorough. So this may be helpful, this may not be, but we thought you know it can be common for some people to feeling stuck 
um, not sure what to do with their feelings, their energy around this event or other events. And so we just kind of brainstormed on a couple of ideas. Um, like we've said, good to connect with people. Some people wanna volunteer or make donations or get more information um, if they haven't been impacted, but you know, are feeling almost like the secondary or um, trauma of it all. So we're gonna actually give some ideas on this at the end. Um, it's also normal and not uncommon for people to then start planning. Like, okay, everything was fine in my house, but now I've done this plan or I've checked my insurance, but some people have experiences like this that make them plan or reevaluate for future events. That's not uncommon and um, that's okay if that's something someone might do. Some people might look to like not only volunteer, but specifically get involved or get trained in certain areas, get more involved with their, um, their church or their spiritual beliefs. Um, but the big takeaway from this is to always be kind of looking at our self-care. How are we taking care of ourselves, even if we were not impacted, but we will have or might have, excuse me, emotions around events that have happened. I mean, it's been a lot these last two years. <laughs> Um, for us as a nation, but for us as a county. And so how are we taking care of ourselves? And this is not my five minutes of, you know, bubble bath self-care stuff. This is really wanting people to think intentionally. What are my preventative self-care techniques? What do I do when I get up in the morning before I go on to my task or if it's a day off? What are preventative things that I can do that are free and accessible? What are things I can do where I am at work? but I met with a colleague who was impacted and I'm having my own emotions and I need a break. Like, what can I do that takes five minutes? Um, like, you know, I try and work near a window so I can look out it and count all the things that are green or um, count all the things that are peeking through that are white, a way to ground myself, take deep breaths. Um, we also need self-care that's gonna energize us. And we also need self-care that is gonna ground and calm us. Um, I can give a time where I was super amped up from a really tough phone call. I did not need an energizing self-care technique. I needed a grounding and my heart rate calmed. So I went for a, a walk and I did um, diametric, diametric uh, deep breathing exercises. I recently bought these grounding cards that I just, me and my son just randomly will like pick a card and like do a grounding activity that's randomly assigned to us. Um, so that's what I mean by self-care. Carla, would you like to add to that? <laughs> no, I think, that was, I think that was good. Okay, so we want to kind of also talk a little bit about how we respond to unexpected situations and experiences. So I wanted to talk about the locus of control. Um, and so when we talk about locus of control, um, locus of control refers to how strongly we believe that we have control over our experiences or the specific situation. Um, this was a principle originated from Julian Rotter in 1954 in social learning theory. And what it breaks it into is an internal locus of control, meaning that um, the way that you respond to situations or your control lies within, or are you a person that is, thinks about or believes in external locus of control, meaning that the situation around you determines um, how things go or um, the trajectory of the issue or concern. And so um, one thing to remember is that you cannot stop hypothetical or real worries from occurring, but you can control how you respond to them. So when we talk about internal or external locus of control, I want you to think about particular situations that you might be in. And this is where this slide in the next is where we want you to actually get out a piece of paper and then I'll tell you some instructions in just a moment. But for now, we want you to think about, um, do I typically respond um, to things by things that are happening around me, show me that I can't do anything about them. Everything around me is dictating what's happening or do I shift to internal locus of control? I look at what I can do to um, assess the situation or to respond. Um, there's a quote here by Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor of the Holocaust, who said, between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I thought that that was a really great quote from him because I think what this is saying 
is that we have the power to choose um, how we respond to things and how we overcome challenges. Um, some things are just out of our control, but we really want to focus on what's in our control, which um, is the next slide. But uh, really quick, what I wanna say that if we shift our focus to what we can control, this then leads to more meaningful, um, lasting um, differences in our well-being, our physical health, and our overall performance. Okay, so I wanna talk about this focus of your circle of influence. I'm adding this to this locus of control. Um, Stephen Covey's model of the seven habits of highly effective people um, connected and applied the locus of control to this particular model here. Talks about your circle of influence includes the things that you can affect directly. The circle of concern is all the things that you care about, but you really don't have much control over. So when we talk about um, our focus, there's a reactive focus and then there's a proactive focus. So what I want you to do with a piece of paper is I want you to make these two circles. The outer circle is a circle of control. And then the inner circle is a circle of influence. So circle of concern, if I didn't say that right, and then circle of influence. Okay. When we talk about circle of concerns, these are all the concerns that one might be having. Okay, so whether that might be related to specifics around the fire, whether that might be related to another concern that you're having in your life. But I want you to put those out there. Um, and then I want you to think about circle of influence. And when you, we talk about circle of influence, we're talking about the things that you have control over. Who is it that you need to bring part of your team to help you deal with these concerns? Or what is it that you need to do to respond to these concerns? What are the questions that you might be able to get answered that respond to the concerns? And what Stephen Covey mentions is more so about how if you are proactive, then that means that you are focusing more on your circle of influence and it will be larger than your circle of concern. Because I'm looking at my locus of control, which is internally what I can control what I can do, who I can connect with, who are the people, what are the things, what questions am I getting answered that's able to turn, my, I can turn my attention on that, then onto all of the concerns that I have going on. And eventually that circle of influence then begins to overtake the circle of concern. So when you're thinking about all of these concerns, I want you to kind of think about being, those concerns shrinking based on the amount of the circle of influence and what you put in that space. Jessica, what are your thoughts? I think that this is a really great activity to start thinking about this. I was trying to find the link because this is actually a great plug that we have this training available for staff and faculty at CU Boulder, Stephen Covey's uh, seven effective skills. So I think if you're liking and wanting to learn more about this, I didn't find the link right now, but you can get more on this um, through free trainings here at CU. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so really, you know, take the time even after this presentation to really get that down. I see Aaron saying it feels good to be able to write them down. And it does because we hold so much in our head and our heart and our body. And that's when the, um, the angst and the in intensity of, of how we're feeling starts to amplify because we're holding on to so much. But when we get it down on paper, it really helps us to kind of strategize and start thinking and shifting up to that more higher level of thinking um, in, in our bodies and brains um, to deal with the different concerns we're having. So I'm hoping that this could be something that's a helpful strategy, uh, even with work uh, experiences outside of traumatic experiences as well. So the next concept that we wanted to talk about was survivor's guilt, because this is something that can come up in a variety of different types of traumatic events and experiences, especially large ones. And so um, thank you, Angie. So I think we just want to acknowledge that this is a real thing and you might have our own feelings of it, or we might have colleagues or students or family members who might be having some of this uh, come up for them. Um, and what surviving really means. Um, oh, my house is still standing, but their impact could be still different and they might still have different needs. But, you know, being in a neighborhood where others aren't having their houses, um, this is just some, a concept that we thought we would bring up and share. And then we'll also give some tips on um, how to cope 
if you might be feeling this way or if you are talking to someone who might be feeling this way. Does this, is this a term people have heard about before or, or other thoughts kind of on this uh, concept of survivor's guilt? I think really quick, um, Jessica, I wanted to add that when you're thinking about um, guilt in general, I wanted to add that guilt is typically a response for like atonement, right? Something that you did maybe wrong or a mistake that was made. But in this instance, this is kind of, it's like an unnecessary guilt because it was nothing that you could do or contributed to the incident occurring or the traumatic event from happening. So that might help one to be able to shift uh, and kind of shift away from that guilt. So I just wanted to mention that too. Yes, thank you for making that distinction because I think that is um, really important. And um, it's also going to be something that might come up and how can we accept that feeling, allow that feeling to come. And then if we're noticing that feeling, what could we do with it? We could start again, connecting with supports um, and different kinds of supports, you know, ones that are able to talk with you about it and validate it and explore it. Um, also turning to mindfulness techniques. There are tons online. There's ones on how to take deep breaths, how to connect with your environment. I have a lot of clients who use five senses if they have all five available to them to be able to connect with the present moment and their current environment. What are five things that I see that I can describe? Uh, four things that I can feel or touch, three things that I can smell and so on and so forth to get connected to the present moment. Um, if we're noticing our own survivor's guilt or someone else expressing that, uh, talking with them about what are their self-care practices, um, making sure they're not things that they're doing later next week, or, oh, I have this vacation planned in two weeks. My boss always hates it when I'm not doing well. And I'm like, yeah, but I took, you know, February 14th off. She's like, it's January 3rd. Um, so, I mean, wanting to make sure we're talking about in the moment daily routine self-care. Uh, for some, it's doing something good for others, bringing someone food, making a donation, uh, giving someone a call. And then, of course, we want to notice if this is continuing to go on, we do have free services for you all on this campus of professionals who are here um, to explore it with. Jessica, there's a few things in the chat where someone said stacking survivor's guilt several times over for the last two years feel multiplicative, not just addictive. Mm -hmm. And then someone else just shared an experience where they felt uh, their survivor's guilt and um, felt like they caused the problem. Um, and yeah, self-blame is a part of that, absolutely. Um, and so, um, yep, these are some good tips they were saying to, to help cope. Yeah, and thank you for sharing those, yeah. Okay, so we want to kind of talk, we have uh, two more slides before we get to the resources, and we wanted to talk about um, anniversaries and trigger events. Um, this is a part of that uh, acceptance stage in the grief cycle that I was talking about that might lead one back to one of the other uh, stages of this cycle. And so um, when you might experience um, an anniversary or something like a trigger, like, for example, um, unfortunately, the smell of smoke or um, um, fire alarms or um, kind of emergency vehicles going by that might spark some type of emotion. And so we wanted to mention um, trigger events are a thing. And so our anniversaries of the event, whether that might be a week anniversary, monthly, yearly. Um, and so being aware that special days may be difficult. Um, even if you have um, something like a birthday during this time, like and just feeling really heavy, um, whenever you are experiencing you know, a special day because you may not be in your home anymore. And the last time that event happened, you were in a space uh, that was your home or um, it might be another event where even if it's a loss of, of someone. Um, yes, like grocery shopping at King Supers, absolutely. Or someone said when it rained um, outside that they felt anxiety for a long time, absolutely, or after the floods. Um, being gentle with yourself is gonna be so important during these times, being able to look at um, these environmental factors happen um, out of your control. 
Um, and so this might be a time where you have to take some time to yourself. Being able to also participate in activities that you enjoy, like for example, I've, you know, when I work with people who have lost a, someone in their life and it's their anniversary, we talk about how can you commemorate that person or what can you do special for yourself that day, whether that's getting a your favorite drink at Starbucks or whether that's, you know, taking a chance to watch a, a favorite movie of yours or make something that represented that person. Well, that's very similar in this case. Uh, maybe that might be connecting with a family or being able to uh, participate in an activity. Um, talk about your loss is going to be so important. I cannot say that enough. Um, talking about it um, when you're ready is um, important to do so because it really just brings about that this was a thing that happened, that I don't have to bury this event in the past and just move on with my life, that this is something that was real, has impacted me, and has forever changed me. And so it's okay to talk about that um, if you need to and when you need to. Um, drawing on your faith, your spiritual connection can be very helpful as well. Um, accepting kindness from others when you're ready, as we've mentioned throughout the process and throughout this presentation, that's going to be helpful too. And then you may want to take attention from yourself and help others. Um, sometimes when you lose something or a person, you might want to extend your attention to somebody else who has or some other experience that helps bring about kind of these positive emotions in yourself um, and work through these particular days or these difficult times. So it's okay to be anticipatory as well if you know something's coming up and you want to prepare for that. It's okay to plan ahead for those anniversaries or to plan ahead um, for those particular events um, in order for you to have some sort of sense of safety and um, to be able to work through uh, these different unexpected things. Speaking of favorite Starbucks drinks, I just got delivery, so I'm just very excited. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that moment that he secretly was just delivered Starbucks. Yeah, um, someone said in the chat that um, after the fire, there was another windy day that brought up some anxiety. Absolutely, absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking about. These unexpected events, and in addition to the anniversaries are all going to bring about emotions that it's important to take care of yourself when they occur. So we wanted to ask you all, we'll give some suggestions on this last slide before we go into resources, but how are you all, if you feel comfortable sharing, taking care of yourselves um, while you're in a supporting role? Um, so opening it to the floor. People feel like sharing. I'm willing. I, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm sorry if I'm jumping over someone, but I'm willing to jump, talk a bit. Um, so Bernadette Stewart, my community hasn't seen me for a while, and so I'm I'm so glad to be here with you all. I just want to say, literally last night when I was on a call with campus HR um, and leadership. I had a break. I just said, this is not sustainable. I do not know how the, the people that remain. So it's like a form of survivor's guilt, right? Is that it feels like those of us that are still here that still have a job that haven't left, we're holding up an entire university and that is not sustainable. On top of responding to traumatic event after traumatic event. And so I just wanna say, I want to be vulnerable and honest and tell you guys like it's this is rough and I don't I don't know how to manage it other than to just keep vocalizing it and that's kind of like my next step step forward the other thing that I'll say is one of the points on your slide um some of the, your suggestions or or what we maybe frequently do um talked about you know wanting to do something good for others and I think with this Marshall Fire what we've also seen is like this outpouring of people wanting to act to to do exactly that to feel better and and that's also um that's also overwhelming to some extent right for for a system that isn't prepared for everyone to want to give all at once so it's just what I will say is this community is extraordinarily strong um, and also breaking down at the same time. And I just, I just wanna say, I don't, I don't have any answers and all I can do is use my voice and say, it is rough what, what folks are going through. And I'll, I just wanna look at Carla and Jessica. I think all the time about how 
this is your you your job is to li to listen and to be in these kinds of deep conversations and i don't know how the heck you guys do it so um anyway i'll just say that's i just want to be honest about how i feel thank you for sharing that absolutely thank you for sharing that wow it's, it's so complex um so complex with the system and and with helping and with being empathetic and then trying to run a university is just really challenging. So I just appreciate you for sharing that. The other people are giving you kudos in the chat for sharing as well. Absolutely. Um, there's a few things in the chat too um, that I wanted. Somebody said making self time, I'm sorry, making time for self care, even if it means shifting your work schedule. Um, spending more time with family, uh, they really do help in holding me together and vice versa. Um, Yes, um, and then kudos to Bernadette and then someone else just mentioning that, um, realizing that I've missed it. Oh, realizing that suffering from secondary trauma. Um, yep, being nicer to yourself is gonna be something that I think um, we want you to pull from this um, rather than pushing, absolutely. Somebody said Zumba, is that That's way? me. Oh, That's is that me. you? Okay, <laughs> Zumba, Zumba. Um, yes, get your, get your body moving. Um, getting some of that energy out that you can't express in words. Uh, making time to sit and read, lose yourself. Yes, distractions can be really helpful. You have to be careful because you don't want to distract too much and take yourself away from um, reality and what's happening. But absolutely taking time, to, moments of just reading a book or getting yourself out into a different zone is helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see here. Go ahead, Jessica. I was going to say, seeing the comment about creating community, I just, I have to say over the last year and sadly having done this work for 20 years and responded to many disasters and being someone who's grown up and lived in Boulder County for, for my whole life, um, community is so important. And I think it felt really hard last year and probably still feels a little hard with what's going on with everything, but really connecting with community, building community is, is really important in trying to find that, be it with one neighbor, be it with a whole group of, of neighbors. Um, but I really like that that was said and would re-echo that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then Bernadette mentioned too, just being together, people showing up, being here um, is, is helpful and absolutely pulling on connection that was talked about in the video with Brene Brown. Jessica just mentioned that we're talking about it. Connection is so important. Um, to, to work through challenges and to get through tough times. Yes. So in wake of time, we are just, uh, you've all mentioned a few things. We'll just highlight a few more. We wanna make sure we're doing our basic needs. I will say sometimes as a helper, I do skip these. I jump right to uh, the skip the lower higher higher I give needs and try to do the other ones. But no, drinking my water, getting food, getting sleep. I'm really intentional on that, that doing those. Um, I think we've said connection a lot, um, finding places that feel safe to us and recognizing that word safe means different things to different people. Um, taking breaks from things um, like media, social media, the news. Um, definitely watched a lot of news on the 30th and then was like, all right, I gotta take a news break or a social media break. Someone already mentioned, you know, dancing, music, reading, um, cooking. Some, some like some of those more than others, but some way to move our bodies um, in various ways. So these are just a few more that we thought we'd throw up there, but we really wanted this to be a conversation, but not also so not to suggest anything. Mm -hmm. anything. Else that people want to add and or Carla before we just finish up with some resources. No, I think it's just that that one part, the third, um, the third line towards the, the right side, li uh, little breaths of letting go. I think are really important when you're in a supporting role. It seems like you just want to just hold on and, you know, and just be with them. And if I let this go, that means I don't care. And it's okay to have space for that where you dive in and then you dive out and being able to allow yourself to do kind of that. Um, and even when you're actually experiencing grief or you're the person supporting someone who is experiencing loss or grief, it's okay to do that. And you're human. Um, and that's actually healthy to do that. So I just wanted to highlight that part. We'll, we're going to bold that. I'm bolding it right now. I have the other <laughs> for, for next week. Anything else from the group? 
Okay. Oh, do we have the slides? Yes. Um, we will Oops. go give the size, Aaron. Oh, the slides. Yes. Somehow I just went backwards. So apologize. Oh, because it saw me bold it. <laughs> and I think they have like about five more minutes um, in their meeting. So yeah, we're going to go to the resources. Aaron will send this out to, to you all so that you'll have access to these links. And um, yes. Yeah, Aaron, I, I, I've turned it into a PDF. So I'll get that to Aaron. We put all these, a lot of links in the chat when we started the presentation. This website at the top, we're really trying to have it be the one-stop shop for CU people impacted. I actually just sent this website on a little brochure over to the Disaster Assistance Center. So if anyone's going over there that are affiliated, they know that we have a website where we're trying to keep everything from FSAP and OVA to the HR guidance to where you can donate. So that's supposed to be our go-to place for our CU community. Um, we've highlighted a few other resources on here as well. Um, Carla, did you want to say anything about any of these specifically? No. And then we do want to add community resources. So the first link, if you heard someone ask earlier about community versus CU. So there are people who are impacted who are not affiliated to CU. So their first stop should be this website from um, Boulder County. Um, they have it in Spanish as well. That's going to be all the information on FEMA, Red Cross, insurance, smoke mitigation, um, and also people who want more in-person information where they have questions. Every time there is a large disaster, um, a center called a DAC, Disaster Assistance Center, is set up, usually somewhat nearby. This one's over on Public Road, kind of over by Clinica, and this is a place where, the, I mean, I went there the other day. It is, is one of the biggest ones I've ever been to, um, probably just because they really got a good, great location, but they have so many tables there. They have food, they have even daycare. If you need to drop your kiddo off while you go fill out the Red Cross form or the FEMA form, they have almost all the different insurance companies there. They have information on smoke mitigation. They have advocates there. They have counselors from mental health partners. They now have OVA, FSAP and other stuff that I dropped off for them there. Um, so it's really supposed to be this one-stop shop and it doesn't matter how you've been impacted. If you have a friend that was impacted, if your house um, has smoke, but is still standing, they really don't want people to reiterate. It doesn't matter how the impact is, but this is the place to go to get all the best accurate information. I will say that all of you who have great energy and want to help, don't bring donations here. <laughs> that is not helpful. It's, it's always nicely suggested, but if you want to donate, that's going to be our next slide. Um, so I will go to that and you will get all of these slides. Um, so people who want to donate monetarily, we have the countywide fund. It's the same fund that collected funds after King Supers. So um, if you want to donate, that can impact anyone who is impacted. We then have our CU funds. If you want to specifically support CU people who are impacted and then Red Cross and Colorado Gives, and it looks like Elevations Credit Union have also sped up set up specific funds. Some people want to volunteer. So instead of like just randomly calling, they've now created a page where they're collecting all of this and you can get involved in various ways now or later. And then people who want to donate goods, um, these are the two places they recommend, either going to the place where it will tell you to where to bring the goods and our CU Buff Pantry, which is amazing before the fire and continues to be amazing. Um, they also are accepting um, stuff as well. So that's us with one minute to spin. We're gonna have to cut it for Wednesday. <laughs> well, Jessica and Carla, um, I know we are doing a deep bow of gratitude for you demonstrating care and helping to support a culture of care for our college community and the entire campus. And so, you know, it looks like we've just got a few seconds left. How about um, we all just give them a little love and appreciation for all of their expertise and heart. Thank you so much. Um, Shelly, want to turn it over to you and just see if we have any wrap up items. <laughs>